Good to go. Hello, everyone. Hope you have had a lovely holiday week. We are here tonight from the LA South Chamber of Commerce, and we represent the health and wellness team led by Chef Cheryl Tate. We're here to present to you how to keep your aging loved ones safe during the winter. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we're glad to answer them after our presentation. I am Shamika Carter, a board certified adult and gerontology nurse practitioner. I work with the 40 and over population, adult medicine. I've been a nurse for about 26 years and I've had my own private practice for the last two and a half to three years. We treat all chronic illnesses and we teach people how to prevent chronic diseases from occurring. I believe that health begins in your very own kitchen. And with that, it gives you the ability to heal your own body from the inside out. I also believe that health begins, our health progresses with you working your body out. So with that, we have Chef Belinda and Chris, the personal trainer here, and we're going to get some insight from the experts about how we could help keep our aging loved ones safe during the winter. So Chef B, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, good evening, everyone. And I can't have a laugh because you always introduce me as an expert. So thank you for the promotion. <laughs> I appreciate that. But hi, everyone. I'm Belinda McKinney, also known as Chef B. Um, I'm a graduate of Dallas School of Culinary Arts of 2001. <clears throat> I've worked in uh, corporate uh, kitchens for over the past 18 years. Um, to add to that, just this past June, I received an AA in theology from Bible Enrichment School of Theology with the Chancellor Beverly Crawford. Uh, I am the sole proprietor of Heaven and Earth Purpose Kitchen, and I serve the community uh, healthy meals and, and uh, along with education, emphasizing on whole plant. And so my community is going to be around the 40 to 65 plus senior uh, range. Um, my services include meal prepping, personal chefing, catering, um, and as I mentioned, cooking classes one-on-one uh, with the emphasis on holistic nutrition, whole, uh, whole plant. And I'm a proud member of the LA South Chamber of Commerce and a part of the health and wellness team. And I'm very delighted to be here. And thank you guys for joining us today. Thank you for that. And Chris, can you introduce yourself? Good evening, everybody. I'm Chris Laurie. I'm an LA native. Um, I'm a personal trainer and nutrition coach, primarily in the Los Angeles and Inglewood areas. Um, I've been personal training for the past, going on seven years. And just about a year ago, I, I thought about, you know, furthering my education in nutrition as well, because we know that's important. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I primarily work with let me see. I work with everybody, but most of everybody's 30 plus, 30 plus. So I think my youngest might be around like 26, 27. The oldest client I have is 72. Um, yeah, I'm just here to, you know, figure out the things when it comes to exercise that we could implement in our lives right now. Don't, no matter what, what your lifestyle is, you know, I know a lot of us, as we get older, we get a lot of responsibilities and whatnot, but there's still a little bit of time we could add in 15 minutes, 20 minutes. That'll do. And staying consistent. That's the most important thing. We we can't start off hot, start off when we're motivated and then just fall off. It's just about staying consistent, just doing a little something. Something is better than nothing. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much, Chris. So as the weather gets colder and winter sets in, it's important to make sure that our elderly relatives are safe. If they live alone, there are some simple things we could do to help them stay, stay safe during the winter months. And we're gonna be discussing ways to ensure their safety from depression, from falls, and from harm during the winter season. The first measure to help keep them safe is just checking in on them regularly. 
checking in on your senior relatives regularly is one of the best ways to help them stay safe during the winter months. Give them a call, drop by, text them, just make sure they're safe. One of the things is because we're all busy, and I know us in the chamber, we're all business owners, so we're ultra busy, is time. Time is an issue. So a lot of times if I call my mom or call my, my aunt, I know the conversation is going to be really long. So I front load the conversation with, I only have 15 minutes, but I wanted to check on you to make sure you're okay. And by front, and load, front loading the call or the conversation with that, it, it puts in their mind that she only had this amount of time. And with that time, what I do is I just listen and allow, give them the floor, allow them to vent. Whatever they want to talk about, it's their time. And I let them talk. And that helps a lot. Um, so Chef Belinda, what are some ways that you can make sure your aging relatives are safe during these winter months? Well, um, starting off is um, I my, my parents are no longer here. They are with the Lord, um, but I am still a daughter before I, I'm a chef. And so I, you know, if they were alive, they would be in their nineties. Um, so I, um, sometimes making my mission and then sometimes by default, I just become engrafted into that family of, the, of my client. Um, as I mentioned, most majority of my client is going to be over the 65, roughly really around the 80, uh, some in the 80, uh, 80 range, 75 and 80. Um, and either they are, um, either they, they are empty nesters or um, maybe they're a widow, widower, or they may also have strange relationships with their with their children, their older children. So it is essential um, to you know make sure I have a healthy relationship with them. Um, so I I do empathize you know with them, like I said, being someone's daughter. So um, just being available to them, listening, uh, checking in on them beyond the scope of my my business. Uh, yes, I'm there to prepare a meal and go to the next client, but, you know, I can tell when there's that loneliness where they just, like you just mentioned, they want to kind of, you know, take that time and it's like, I got to go, but I will, um, uh, I like what you just mentioned about front loading. Hey, Miss Mother, whatever, Mother Winnie, um, I really have to get to the next client. I can spend like 10 minutes with you extra, but letting them know that, you know, I, you know, I'm not just here to do a job, but I do care about them. So that speaks volumes. Um, you know, so that's one thing. Um, and then just, I would say to the family of those, you know, the, the, the client that I am, uh, preparing that meal is to make sure that, you know, we do have that relationship outside the scope of the client. Um, so that way that, you know, building that trust with that client builds trust with their, with their family, they trust me that they, um, A, I'm providing a service to them, but also that I'm going to communicate if there is some issue in the home, I'll be able to communicate that effectively to to their to their loved one. Nice. Thank you. Chris, how do you check on your aging loved ones during these cold winter months? Now, I, I believe uh, this is an area I definitely can improve on. Um, as far as my aging loved ones that I still have here, uh, definitely my dad, he's out in the valley and my mother and my stepdad, I still stay with them. So I kind of see them every day, but just with my dad, you know, I could be a little bit better as far as like, um, upping the, the communication, but I think we fairly stay in touch, whether, uh, whether it's a call or, you know, my dad is uh, on social media now, so he's always checking in on on the things that I'm part of. And, you know, he'll like, he'll comment on some of the things that I got going on. Um, but, yeah, so whenever I'm around my dad or any loved ones, um, I just really try to be present. I think that's the most important thing. You know, they just want to know that somebody cares for them. And you know, somebody's checking on them. Um, 
you know, we don't really have all the studies quite yet about, um, you know, the pandemic shutdown, but I, I'm pretty sure we felt it, you know, as far as like taking the social aspect out of our lifestyles, it's definitely done a number on, on us, not only on our physical health, but also our mental health. Um, so yeah, so whenever I'm right around my older loved ones, it's just being present with them, you know, talking to them and really just creating some type or trying to create some type of routine with them um, just to constantly check in, make sure they're all right and they have everything they need. Great answer. Thank you. And everyone, Chris is driving because he had two games tonight, one earlier and then one at 530. So He's like wretching home and we were initially supposed to do this on the 30th, but we're doing it tonight and Chris still is here for us. So thank you so much, Chris, for that. Um, measure number two, it's important to ensure that our parents and aging loved ones in the community, the ones that we assume responsibility for are, are getting proper nutrition. There are about 56% of Californians, 65 and older, with some type of heart condition. And we know that heart disease is the number one killer in the United States since 1919. In 1918, it was the flu. But from 1919 to present day, heart disease is the number one killer in the United States with high blood pressure leading the bunch. So. I like personally to make soups and take them around to my uncle, to my dad, just some type of quick filling nutritious meal so that they have some type of nutrition going in their body. Belinda, what are some simple nutritious ideas that we can incorporate to make sure that our folks are eating well? Um, well, ding, ding, ding. Uh, yes, yeah, soup, 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 soups. Um, again, dealing, um, you know, preparing meals for the elderly, um, their appetite is also diminishing. Um, so soups are definitely going to be a no brainer. Um, one of the things I have incorporated is, um, going ahead and having, um, you know, the soup already warmed, but I put it into a thermos for them. Um, this will give you a little peace of mind without knowing that they don't have to stand in front of a stove trying to warm something up, or maybe there's a mobility issue and, um, you know, getting up and down, there's maybe there's not a caregiver there to feed them or whatnot, but you know, you can have those things easily, readily available. Um, one of the things uh, we were talking about, um, you know, there's arthritis that sets in, um, you know, so one of the things I will do is loosen the lid because we know it vacuum seals, you know, vacuum seals itself. And so that could be a little difficult trying to open it. Um, just remind the, I'm always reminding the client just to be careful that it's hot, you know, make sure it's not too piping hot to where they, you know, it does burn them. Um, but that's a, that's a great idea. Um, I also be I'm very mindful of um, if there's some denture um, you know, issues, um, maybe, you know, chewing. Um, I, I, this is what I find out that if I see food <laughs> that's not been eaten, of course, I'll question why. Um, and then if it's something that's consistent, um, I'll have to get to a little bit, dive, dive a little deeper. And then I come to find out that there may be a denture issue where they don't like chewing certain things or, is, you know, something's too chewy. Um, so without giving too many purees, uh, uh, you know, yes, I can, you know, maybe I'm dicing the meat just a little bit smaller or shredding it or something like that, um, or just avoiding some um, vegetables that may have a little bit too much chew. Sometimes mushrooms have a little bit too much chew to it, um, and it's just uh, uncomfortable. So being able to identify those things with my client, you know, helps them you know, making sure that they get the proper nutrition because that's the last thing we, I want them is to not eat because of something is uncomfortable for them and they may not be speaking up. Yeah, and I like that you say um, 
with the containers, the twist containers, the jars. Make sure that you're twisting it, not to the point where when they pick it up, it's gonna drop out of the bottom, but just enough so they can open it because what I have noticed in my career that a lot, a lot, a lot of um, elderly people have arthritis in their hands. And even me right now, like I'm 51 and I, my hands hurt back in the 90s, we used to write to chart. So my hands even hurt at times. So a lot of times you, you go in their homes and they have jars of different stuff, but it's not open because it's too tight. And if you think about it, we use our hands from the time we're born unless you lose them until the time of death. So you're constantly using your hands. So wear and tear over the years causes them, causes arthritis to set in. And then especially during the winter months, it's even more painful for them. So just like you said, making sure that those containers are twisted and not too tight where they can't get in at all. A lot of times, many people develop chronic diseases as a result of eating unhealthy foods or having unhealthy habits. And I do Medicare annual visits. I go into the patient's home and I assess them in their own environment. I notice a lot, 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 lot that there are canned goods and boxed foods in their homes that they indulge in. These are ultra processed foods. Um, they're just not eating healthy whole foods a lot of times. And a lot of it is convincing them to eat foods that require an acquired taste because now we have high blood pressure and we can't eat the canned beans or the boxed foods. So Belinda, how can we convince them to eat foods that are, um, or that might have an acquired taste, something that they're not used to, but they can acquire the taste that over time. And what is your idea of a food or dish that many people would say, you know, oh, that's something that I've never had, but you could convince them that this is good for you? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and this is across the board. I don't think it has anything to do with any age because all of us can t learn from <laughs> learn from this. Um, but um, it is it is sometimes it can be challenging. Some you know, there's uh, I have seniors that are like, I didn't eat vegetables when I was a kid, and I'm not eating them now. You know, and it's sometimes a fight. But what do I do? Um, you know, we can incorporate smoothies. We can incorporate juices. Uh, especially when, in a, if I'm not getting enough vegetables or, you know, leafy green vegetables into their diet, because, um, you know, that's going to help with, um, you know, um, their bone density, you know, getting the vitamin K and D and C and all the things that they need to help to, to create, you know, maintain that healthy uh, skeletal. Um, so I have to do that. Um, another thing is uh, my component is edu educating. It's not so much always just about the f like food, eat, 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 but why, why are we eating? So that's another thing too. We all can like, um, you know, look at food differently as to, you know, why am I eating this carrot? Oh, because, you know, it's healthy for my eyes, you know, um, uh, versus I love peach cobbler too, but you know, peach cobbler may attribute to glaucoma, you know, or diabetes or things like that. So weighing those things out, why do I eat? Um, why am I incorporating uh, dandelion in this salad? Well, I'm detoxing my liver, you know, I'm detoxing my kidneys versus, you know, some other, you know, form. So I, I love having those conversations with my, with my seniors, because it's, it's like talking to my mom. Because I, I care about you, right? I, you know, I'm not just kind of trying to take the money and go. Like, I really, I don't want to do any harm to you. But then we also have to take a better dive as well, because there may be some things that if there is an underlying condition, such as a kidney, you know, disease, there, there, there is a specific green that I can't give them because of it's high in iron or, you know, or, or potassium or something that, you know, because they're already compromised in their kidney. So I have to, you know, um, have a, a, a specific uh, diet, you know, that is equally nutrient dent, uh, dense, but that's not going to do any more harm. And then also at the same time, how do we get that kidney healthy, right? Get it back healthy. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely, um, you know, it's a challenge it can be, but I'm up for that. But 
ultimately I want to hear them say, hey, you know, I'm seeing a little bit better or, hey, I'm feeling a little bit more energy or, hey, my bowel movements, you know, I'm going regularly. So then we see the the fruits of that labor coming to fruition and then, then they have a better understanding of, you know, why am I eating this? It's just helping to support my, my entire system and making me feel, um, you know, better, you know, being able to thrive. Yeah, thank you. And I like that you say educate, educate, educate. I tell everyone <clears throat> education starts at birth and it ends at end of life um, because a lot of times they just don't know. People just don't know what's healthy. I had a patient again, I do Medicare wellness exams. And when I go in the house, one of my responsibilities is to look at the food, look in the cabinets and make sure they have appropriate food. And I had a patient, he had congestive heart failure, another heart disease, end stage congestive heart failure. He went to a nutritionist, doctor sent him to a nutritionist and the nutritionist told him to get brown bread. So he told me, I, I got the brown bread, you know, I got the wheat cereal and I'm looking at the bread. I said, no, not brown bread. It's whole wheat bread. He's like, no, no, no. The nutritionist told me to get brown bread. Well, I had to break it down to him, educate him, let him know brown bread is just, that's just food coloring. That's just dye. She meant whole wheat bread, 100% whole wheat. And I had to demonstrate to him, show him what it looked like, what whole wheat bread looks like. This is what she's talking about. And he's like, oh, well, okay. So it is a lot of educating. And I love that you put that piece in another, like just letting them know if you eat these carrots, it's good for your eyesight. It's going to help your eyesight. Or if you drink this dandelion tea, it's going to help, you know, um, detox your liver so just because people just don't know these things and it's our responsibility as experts to let them know as experts in this field to let them know um another measure is helping them prepare their physical bodies um to prevent injury there's some simple things you could do to help your aging relatives prepare their physical bodies to prevent falls from occurring <clears throat> excuse me making sure they have rails in their homes, making sure that the floors are clear of those throw rugs. And that those simple things will help prevent a fall. And if they're doing exercises, they could be equipped to rebound from a fall um, and it'll help prevent breaks from having or happening, fractures from happening. So Chris, falls are a humongous problem with the aging population. What are some physical routines they can do daily in the comfort of their own homes and outside to strengthen their legs and strengthen their core to prevent a fall or even prevent a hip fracture if they were to fall anyway? So one of the, uh, of course, we like, for an older person, for the older population, the fall could definitely be fatal. Because a lot of times they fracture, whether it's a hip bone or break any type of bone. And if they're, you know, kind of bedridden, that's where the decline of the health comes. All right. So particularly with my older clients, um, first and foremost, we're doing a full body workout. But I think the the important things that I think about with falling, we think balancing. Um, if you think about the 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 essential daily activities that we have is what toileting. So, you know, getting up and down from the toilet safely. Um, I'm I'm home right now, so I'm a, I'm gonna demonstrate some of these things. So, let, let, I'm gonna uh, show y'all things, but I'll talk until I get some light. And uh, all that, but yeah. So when we Chris, we can't hear you. Chris, your I sound. Think his, I think his his phone is attached to his car. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Chris.
Yeah, Ven is attached to his car. Interruption. Sorry, guys. I just sent him a text, so he'll get it in a second. Okay. Chris, we can't hear you. Check one, two, check one, two. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't know where, uh, I guess I could get into the demonstration. So we talked about toilets and there needs to be some lower body strength. There needs to be some glute strength. So something I see a lot of seniors do when they get down to uh, sit down on a couch, they don't sit down. It's more so like a, a fall. Okay, so something that uh, we could practice, and I say practice because when I say, uh, I know the, the, the general idea of exercises or workouts, it may be something where we have to exhaust ourselves. Now with these things, we're not trying to exhaust ourselves. We're trying to build strength. So this is something that you could practice um, throughout the day. So whether it's a commercial or set a time, couple of minutes in the morning, you want to try to, it doesn't have to be a low challenge. It could be whatever uh, you're able to do. It doesn't need to be too low, um, whatever you can do. You want to be able to kind of control yourself down and sit down instead of just plopping down. All right, so you could do like something like that to practice like maybe three to five reps, just sets of three to five reps throughout the day. So one in the morning, um, lunchtime, evening, or whatever. And then also uh, we talk about balancing. Another thing I see a lot of older clients have issues with, or it's a, it's a challenge. We don't, we don't stand on one foot. A lot of people can't just sit here and just pick up a foot off the ground and be confident in their balance. So just being able to practice this. So if you have like a chair next to you, you can set a chair or a table stop. You can kind of just practice picking up one foot off the ground. And if you do fall, you could, you know, kind of use the chair or the uh, uh, table top as some balance. So you know, practicing that, whatever you could do. I say, I, I usually say 20 seconds, but sometimes you may, 10 seconds may be a challenge. So you can start, you know, doing 10 seconds. And then after a while, when 10 seconds get a little bit easier, then you can increase the time. Um, So we got squats, we got balancing, lifting up your legs, and then um, modified push-ups. So mod modified push-ups. So if we get on the ground, maybe we're not, we don't have the strength to be able to do a regular push-up. We could do something to where our knees are down right here, and we could kind of maybe roll ourselves up just like that. But if that's a challenge to be able to, you know, get up and down from the ground, um, you could set up either um a tabletop or a chair or something sturdy and kind of just do it like I'm doing it against the wall right now. So if you set up against the wall, you can kind of lean against the wall and just do this right here. Okay. And then as time goes on, as that gets a little bit easier, you want the the elevation of the surface that you're using to gradually get down to where if you could work yourself down to the ground, 
You could just start off with knees and you continue to practice. Maybe you could work up to just doing a regular push up. Um, and then also just walking, walking because the aerobic aspect. Um, I know, so, well, particularly, I know my dad got stairs at his house. Um, so if we're not taking care of our uh, 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 aerobic uh, fitness, it could be a challenge going up and down the stairs as well. So we want to be able to, you know, be able to go up the stairs and not be so winded. And yeah, so just pretty much a full body workout strength training uh, with the emphasis of building muscle. And I want the ladies, because I, I hear this all the time. I, I make all my ladies, well, particularly all my clients are women. Everybody's lifting weights. And do not worry about if you lift weights, you're going to start looking like a bodybuilder. One, it's not possible because one, you're not working out as much as a bodybuilder. You're not eating like a bodybuilder. And there's other proponents that go into the formula of building muscle. Um, so you got to build muscle because when when you think of things like, especially for women, but just the older generation or the uh, older population in general, a thing that uh, they suffer from is osteoporosis. So pretty much the bone density uh, get, gets a little bit weaker. And just with doing strength training and building muscle, that could not not necessarily reverse, but it could improve the bone density to where it's a little bit more sturdier for the bones. Um, to where if you do fall, you could kind of just uh, you don't have to break anything when you fall. Um, so yeah, so just pretty much a full body workout, working on the squats. Or if you can't squat, sitting down, up and down from the chair with some control, um, practicing your balancing, you know, picking up one foot off the ground, and also doing some modified push-ups. Those are things that I feel like everybody should do, but particularly the older generation definitely should add that to their uh, their regimen. Thank you for that. Very informative. I just want to to add, just talk about a couple of things you said. The first thing is walking. A lot of people think um, once they go on a weight loss program, walking is not enough. The thing that I like to tell people is walking is not just for weight loss. Like Chris said, walking is very important. It contributes to your cardio, heart, respiratory, lung, help. So when you walk and it does other great things too, the two things that I like that it does the most is when you walk for 20 minutes and you could even break it up in 10 minute sessions, but when you walk for 20 minutes, if you're a diabetic, what it does is your muscles snatch sugar out of your bloodstream, thereby bringing your blood sugar down, right? If you have high blood pressure, and you walk. And we talked about cardiovascular or heart disease being the number one killer in the United States. So if you have high blood pressure and you walk, what happens is your blood vessels open, they dilate, which causes the blood to whoosh through, thereby bringing your blood pressure down. So <clears throat> walking is important for your overall health. It's important for weight loss, maintaining weight loss. It's important important for lowering your blood sugar if you're diabetic, and it's important for lowering your blood pressure if you have high blood pressure or heart disease. The other thing is strength training. So something as simple as um, Chris was telling us, just standing and holding your leg up for 10 to 20 seconds, what it does is it strengthens the muscle around the bone. So in your bone and then around your bone is muscle to cushion that muscle need you need muscle strength around that bone because like he said it decreases it improves osteoporosis and especially women over 40 that's going through perimenopause or menopause we are known to lose bone density over time so we need to strengthen our muscles to prevent fractures 
because it's not a matter of if you fall, it's when you fall. I see so many falls and I see so many fractures and they could have been prevented if the patient had just, you know, increased their muscle strength by doing these simple things, um, lifting the five pound weight, lifting your leg for 20 seconds at a time. Same thing with your blood pressure and blood sugar. Just simply walking 20 minutes a day will bring those numbers down and keep you at an optimal level of health. Um, the next I, measure, I, I, I wanted to uh, clarify one more thing as well when it comes to just exercise, just general exercise. I want folks, because I think, just generally speaking, I think a lot of us only exercise when it's time to lose some weight or if we want to lose some pounds and we need to correlate exercise or just fitness in general, not just with weight loss. Like you can lose weight just by changing the way you eat. We got to look at exercise and fitness and doing these things as things to help our performance, help our quality of life. Because if you, it, I'm pretty sure we all have heard, if you don't use it, you lose it. That's very true. Our bodies are very efficient. So if we stop doing things, like I, um, I'm trying to see who up in here. I don't know. When's the last time we, we ran? Like we sprinted. It was probably since high school and some of us since, since college. So now it's, it's, I'm pretty sure if you try sprinting, you'll either hurt yourself or you, it's like, oh, I forgot how to run. It's because we don't run anymore. So we got to look at fitness in general as things to help our performance. And if we're doing the things when it comes to fitness, if we're doing the things when it comes to nutrition, the weight loss is a byproduct. The weight loss and the fat loss. Because I think a lot of us, we may, uh, yeah, we have goals as far as like a, a certain number on the scale. But I think the most important thing is we want to look good. That's the most important thing. We want to look good. It doesn't really matter what the scale says per se, but we want to look good. Those are byproducts when we're on top of the things we do, uh, on top of our fitness regimen and on top of the nutrition regimen. Yeah, that's pretty much all I want to say. Absolutely. Thank you. We want to function at our optimal capacity. The next thing is a support network. A support network is a person or group of people who your Asian relatives have constant communication with, right? This person or these people will know if there's a problem in the routine. I personally, I speak to my mom often. And if I call her and she doesn't answer, I'll call back within an hour. If she doesn't answer within those two hours, then my plan is to call someone in the surrounding area, sister, brother, uncle, to go check on her. Fortunately, we've never had this problem. But just making sure that you have a support network in place so if your loved one or someone you know, a senior citizen is not answering the phone, you haven't seen them for a couple of days, what's the plan? Who's checking? Who's doing a wellness check, right? So are there any other ways you could think of, Belinda, that our loved ones should can put together a support system? Are there any other ways that we can implement a support network for our loved ones during these winter months? Um, I think I came out the gate talking about how important um, it is to just have, you know, knowing your neighbors, um, building, building the trust with the people that are um, going into the homes of your loved ones, whether it's the gardener, um, the, you know, caregiver, the chef that's going to prepare food, or, or maybe they're having a delivery uh, meals on wheels uh, being delivered, uh, making sure you have those contact uh, numbers and they have yours. Um, so that's very important. Um, utilizing uh, community resources such as like senior um, 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 centers that um, that they um, provide like resources such as, you know, there are some seniors that are, you know, afraid of technology or they're not, you know, proficient in using technology or using a, um, upgrading their phone, as long as they just have a, a, a little flip phone to make that emergency phone call, 
the remainder of the time is probably going to be closed in, inside their purse or, in, you know, in their pocket and that's all they're going to use it for. But if they were introduced to some of the community resources that's available to them to learn in, in a safe environment amongst their peers um, at their pace, maybe they'll be more, um, you know, receptive to upgrading a phone and learning how to use it so they can text or maybe create a, um, you know, Facebook profile, you know, so that would be um, definitely, I think, a suggestion um, to where they can, you know, feel interactive, you know, uh, interact with one another, and then uh, interact with you as well, you know, the, the, the child or, you know, their family, or their grandkids, you know, things like that. Absolutely. What about you, Chris? How do you contribute to ensuring that your aging loved ones have a supportive network to make sure they're safe during the winter? So um, I know I mentioned it a little bit earlier that I could, you know, better my part as far as like reaching out to my dad and just checking in a little bit more. But I am familiar with, you know, some of the people that's um, in my dad's work network so friends that he talked to they have my number um and just for example of why that's important so i know i said i could better my routine with my dad but my dad has routines with other people so there was a time when my dad being retired he he travels a little bit more um there was a time where i know he was traveling and i think he went out to like pachanga or something so um uh, 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 you know, the service, the phone service out that way is not as strong. Or I think it might have been a time where his phone was acting up and somebody that, you know, he's in contact with constantly, somebody that he has a routine with speaking with, you know, they didn't receive their call. I think either at night or in the morning, they usually talk in the morning and they didn't receive their call. So from there, she reached out to me, you know, saying, hey, um, you know, have you spoken to your dad? I haven't spoke to him. Um, I just want to make sure, you know, everything's all right. I'm worried about him. And, you know, from there, I could call. And then once I send a call out, I kind of just wait, give him a little bit of time. Um, and then luckily nothing happened during that time. He reached out when he was able to. But I think that's just important, just being in the network of my dad's network or our loved one's networks, whether it's as friends, um, if they're still working, coworkers. Um, where, wherever they hang out with, you know, try to figure out how you could be in contact with, uh, with somebody in that circle. Right. Nice. I like that. Um, next measure, do you have an emergency plan in place? Make sure you have systems in place for falls, natural disasters, fires, or anything else that you could think of. Make sure that your elderly loved ones are fully educated and made aware of this plan, and they know exactly what to do in the event that they fall and they can't get up or that a fire starts. We don't know what the future holds, but we do know that COVID taught us that we have to be prepared for any and everything at any time. This world can literally shut down. So one of the things that we do, like I said, I do Medicare visits and I go into seniors' homes. And um, one of my duties is to check the smoke detectors to make sure the smoke detectors are working. Um, I check and see if there's a list on the refrigerator of emergency numbers. I also check to see if the patient is diabetic, do they have on a alert bracelet in the event that someone comes to the house, someone calls the paramedic to come to the house and, you know, the paramedics don't know exactly what to do or what's going on. They're not going in blinded. But if the patient have on a medical alert like bracelet, then they know, check their blood sugar. Or if they have a list of medications, if they have an alert bracelet to say they're a stroke victim, they could check, let's implement some clot busters to make sure they're not having an embolism or another stroke. These things are very important um, for your loved ones. Belinda, what are some emergency foods that we can all, not just our elderly relatives, but that we all should have in our homes in the event that an emergency occurs? 
Um, great question. Well, of course, um, we can all go back, um, you know, to what we know, and a lot of us may have been brought up on canned food. So, you know, you know, we talked about, you know, highly processed foods, try to avoid them, but, you know, there's a, there's a time and a place for them, right? Um, you know, our, my grand, my mother, grandparents, they canned foods for a reason, um, for, for such a time. So having canned foods available definitely are, can be essential, um, you know, um, there's sardines, there are, you know, crackers, nut butters, whether it's peanut butter, sunflower uh, butter, tahini, uh, things like that, uh, some honeys. Um, um, if we're talking about, of course, you know, if there's you know, no electricity, then, you know, frozen foods, you probably gonna have to um, cook them right away. But also, it, hand in hand, uh, part of my what I do as well. I also look through the cupboards, as I mentioned. You know, my prop, uh, my clients are around the eighty, you know, seventy five, eighty, and they're from an era, a generation, you know, that they don't throw things away. Um, and um, so I have found, you know, foods, canned foods, or maybe even not, you know, uh, just perishable foods that they're not throwing it away because they, you know, experienced rationings and experienced a depression, uh, the era of depression where, you know, it was feast or famine. So it is a very touchy area that I have to tread lightly um, because I want to respect them um, and their, you know, their privacy. But sometimes I have to do things covertly and just, um, you know, throw that away because, you know, I would not want them to ingest something that is going to cause harm that maybe has botulism you know, from the canned uh, uh, product, um, you know, I, I, I will delicately have a conversation with them. Um, but if there's a lot of resistance, then of course, I, you know, that's not my area of expertise. So I definitely want to let the, you know, their um, loved ones know, or if there is a caregiver, let them know, make them aware of it. Um, so yeah, um, we talked about a little bit about medications, making sure that they have those things really a supply of that. But, you know, there are herbs that are um, that you can have, you know, um, whether it's uh, uh, I think we talked about the immune system. So we talked about mulan and um, milk thistle and um, echinacea, zinc, things like that, where maybe they have to create a tea to help with their immune immune system. And um, there are also herbs that can help with upper respiratory if you're fighting a cold or coming on with a cold. Um, so teas are going to be great to have in the household um, and, and easily to prepare um, in the case of emergency. Not only are they going to keep you warm, but they're also going to help, again, um, you know, boost your immune system, um, you know, giving the antioxidants that you're going to need to help fight off, you know, some type of virus or cold. Thank you. I'd like to add on to that medications. During the pandemic, um, I would go into patients' houses and they wouldn't have enough medication. I told you an example, told you guys an example of a patient I visited. Her blood pressure was 210 over like 100 and she didn't have any blood pressure medication. 911 wasn't answering the phone. Um, so just making sure that you have at least seven days of a prescription left for that, that loved one. The pharmacy is going to call before the seven day period to for them to pick up the medication. It's just up to us to make sure they're not procrastinating and they get they understand the importance of getting there and getting that medication and having it on hand. The other thing is um, I had another patient and I'm checking his medication bottles and he had a medication from 1998. Yeah, 1998. And we're like in 2021. And I'm like, oh Lord, what is this? It, after so long, after they're expired, those chemicals turn to poison. So we just got to make sure that we're getting those old medications out of there and then let him know you can't pour it down the sink, you can't pour it down the toilet, you kind of have to take it to CVS or Walgreens and generally we do that for them like I'll gather the medications and 
dispose of it for them, take it where it needs to go, Walgreens or CVS, but just making sure that they have enough medication to last at least seven days in the event of an emergency and that those medications are not expired, especially from the, non I don't know how we got that 90s thing, but literally 1998, the pill bottle said, and I'm like, what is this? And he's like, my medication. I'm like, oh no, we got to get rid of this. So those two things, Chris, um, what are some routines we should incorporate to ensure that if an emergency does occur, our bodies are ready to respond physically without aches and pains and that nothing is stopping us from moving forward? Um, really, it's just uh, being proactive and, and, and starting with a, a, a fitness program with some of the... Uh, the exercises and movements that I mentioned a little bit earlier, because we don't want to find ourselves to where we're in a situation and we're not prepared. So it's just about being proactive, starting now, not waiting until the last minute. Um, and yeah, just overall, just being proactive. Thank you. So, Belinda, do you have any last thoughts on this subject? We're rounding it up. Yeah, I actually wanted to add to that as I was talking about the herbs. Um, you know, you definitely be surprised uh, that there are herbs that will help with healing. Uh, if in the case, you know, of a of a bone break or um, so, comfrey is one of those, and I actually experienced that for myself. I read about it, but you know, I never had any broken bone. So I had an injury to a really bad roll of the knee. Um, I thought it was broken, but it wasn't. It was like a hair fracture. Um, it was healing, seemed like it, but um, you know, it it was just taking forever, forever and ever to heal. Um, you know, and so using using wisdom, I started like, okay, let me go get this, you know, comfrey and make a tea. And I did. I started implementing that into my diet. Uh, daily just was drinking it and I didn't realize it you know it was within like a couple of weeks that I noticed like I was able to put a lot more weight on it um the pain all of that was gone so I definitely do give credit to that um so you know there are definitely herbs that you can you know keep around in those in those um emergency situations, but you can also just apply it daily. So it's not something that's going, you know, again, have to wait till that emergency come. You want to build and have it, you know, build strength. So it is more preventative. Um, but as you mentioned about the expiration of medication, um, if you do have herbs, you know, they will, you know, you do want to toss them after, a, you know, at least a year um, because they will start to diminish in potency, you know, so um, just check that as well. And um, yeah, I think like I said, the most thing, the most takeaway is um, building that network, building relationships um, with the people around uh, around your loved one. Um, you know, maintaining a healthy, uh, open communication, uh, updating. Uh, if you do have a phone number that you've updated, please make sure you share that with you know the, the contacts because that would. You know, um, anyway, just updating that, uh, keeping those updated contacts. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Chris, let's have your last thoughts on how we can keep our aging relatives safe during the winter. Yeah, just kind of uh, reiterating uh, kind of what I just said uh, a couple of minutes ago is just, you know, being proactive. Um, you know, practicing some of the movements that I've said. So that could be um, squats, um, balancing uh, on one foot, practicing that, build, building our upper body strength uh, with some push-ups or some modified push-ups. And I forgot to mention about core. So with core, um, just building our core strength. So that could be done through some planks uh, 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 or uh, some modified planks. Also, if we're able to, if we have something that is relatively he heavy, 
um, like practicing, like uh, carrying a um, a suitcase. That helps build our our, our core strength as well. Um, but yeah, just overall, just being proactive with your fitness, being proactive with your nutrition, being proactive with you know having plans in place, um, just in case an emergency happens. Thank you. So by following these simple tips, you can help your elderly or aging loved ones stay safe during the winter months. Checking the weather forecast, educating them on basic foods and delivering foods to them um, so they get their taste buds and get used to it. Checking on them and having an emergency plan in place, making sure you have those emergency numbers on the refrigerator, making sure that if they're diabetic, or if they've had a stroke, they have that emergency alert bracelet. So in the event that the paramedics have to come, they know exactly what to start looking for, are all essential for the winter time. And these tips will go a long way in keeping them safe and comfortable all season long. Thank you everyone for attending and Q&A will soon follow.